Everyone joining us in the YouTube video, we're just going to get right into it because I fear the same technical problems that we had last time could potentially crop up again. I'm really hoping not. And if anybody skipped last time, we identified all of the officers and I discovered that the hammocks in Bitter Cold Part 1 are all numbered with the crew numbers of the people who are sleeping in them. And we've been using that to narrow down who all these people are. And I was just going to talk about the two Russian sailors. We still haven't got a method to distinguish between them, but I was just going to point that out. And then get into what I think is my favorite part of the entire game so far. So, this frontmost hammock here, 47... That is Alexei Toprov, according to my list. And hanging from the top of this hammock is this bag with a pipe sticking out of the pocket. Now again, we're overlaying footage from the calling, where we can see one of the guys in the boats smoking exactly this pipe. And on the floor of the boat next to him is that same bag. So... Going to the disappearances, that would be the guy on top, the one who was one of the executioners back in the murder chapter. This is Alexei Toprov. Yep, that sounds good. Oh, Toprov. I feel like I'm, I'm this is one of the points in the game where a lot of people just give up and figure, okay, we got three Russians, we'll just swap around the names until we get it right. Well, I've only got one Russian left, who is Alarkus Nikishin, and this is the only one of them that's left. And of course, that does narrow down the number of people who were left in Chapter 4. We've just got this guy who was translating what the Formosans said in Chinese just before he died. And this guy, whose last words were, give us a weapon, in what is to my untrained ears, most likely an Irish accent. One of the two of them is O'Hagan from Ireland, and I don't think it's the guy who was speaking Chinese. And there we go. All right, three fourths done. Not a lot left. Yep. And while we're on Chapter 4, this is one that I really would love to just go there and actually look at these things live, but we're going to have to overlay footage because getting through Chapter 4 is such a pain to navigate. But at the end of Part 3, we kind of see it being Sia hunched over Samuel Galligan you can't really see what's going on. And it's kind of funny to me that when Miss Lim dies, you have to go back one scene to see what actually killed her. And in this case, going forward a scene, we can see Galligan lying in the boat with something sticking out of his shoulder. It's kind of hard to tell what it is. You know, I assumed it was a knife from looking at it. And the next scene after that, he's gone. I guess Nichols probably dumped his body off the boat for some reason. Don't really understand why he would do that. Maybe the mermaids got to it. But the neat thing is, if you go back to the first part of this chapter and watch what Itbang Sia is doing, when the Chinese guy gets speared in front of him, the spear just barely misses him. Like, a little bit farther, and we would have had two deaths in one. 
look ahead a bit to part two, and he's cutting the ropes on his wrists on the spear that just speared the Chinese guy. And of course, on the floor of the boat is Nikishin's knife. It's just been sitting there the whole time. So what's going on in part three is Itbang has freed his hands, picked up Nikishin's knife, and is stabbing Galligan in the shoulder with it. That's what killed him. And then he cuts the straps on the chest, pulls the shell out of the drawer, and shoves it into whatever it is that's inside the top of the chest. It burns him, destroys the shell, and releases something that stuns all of the mermaids. I don't know if we're ever fully going to explain how that happens, or you know what any of those things are, but I'm calling Galligan knifed by Itbang Sia. Yeah, I think there's some parts that are never like going to be fully explained just by the nature of how we're seeing the things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is part of what fascinates me so much about the game is that there is so much of that stuff that I'm sure there are actual answers to, and maybe I just haven't looked deep enough to find them. But as far as the information that we get purely from this scene, I think that is all of it. We're still going to need a little bit more to resolve the last couple of identities. But since the burned husk of Charles is right here, I do want to pop back in here just for a sec to look at something. So, he's burning to death here. There's uh, Thomas having been thrown through the wall of the cattle pen. It's kind of neat. You know, the uh, that's when the fence gets broken. And that's the only reason we can get to the cow skull in the present. Because we can't jump over the fence and there's no opening in it. But over on this side, the other crab monster is about to come down the four stairs. And we've got Hoskett holding a gun. I noticed that during the original recording. And then here's Charles Minor holding the other gun. Now, against that wall there, that's where Zungi Sathi is going to get shot through by the guy who's across the room from him. But... If you look through the window during that scene, Hoskett is right there in front of the window. And he's got a claw coming at him, and a leg, and I think some spikes shooting at him. I have no idea how he survived, but he did. And he's not the guy with the gun who shot Zungi Sathi. I'm pretty sure that's Charles Minor. I mean, he's the only person who's on the scene that looks vaguely like the person who's holding the gun. So that's my judgment on that one. Yeah, I believe that's how you're supposed to figure it out. That you're supposed to just go back a scene or two and see how the situation develops. Mm -hmm. I think my favorite thing that I noticed during that scene is the captain is actually on the stairs behind the beast. You can just barely see him. But when I was looking at you know, who are the people who are in the scene... I saw the captain there, and I went, what? He's not there the whole chapter, and suddenly he's behind the beast right there at the end. But that's more of a theory kind of thing. The other scene we really need to look at is the Doom Part 2. The old crapper scene. Yep. Yep. As Edward Spratt, the artist, takes his final dump, we've got Paul Moss here, like I said, preparing his boss's meal. A couple of guys eating theirs. Well, one of them eating his. I, I guess actually this is their final meal for both of them. And we got the third mate and his steward walking back to third mate's room with his meal. And there are a couple of hammocks still strung up here. Most importantly, these four are now in the scene and we can quite clearly see them. So they're 43, 44, 48, and 49. 48 and 49 are both unoccupied, but 
that is the other way that you can determine that Abraham Akbar is Abraham Akbar number 52 because 49 is not the one that's been replaced with an X. And more interestingly, in terms of being able to fill in a lot of information, we know that Nathan Peters, number 48, is still alive because his hammock is there. Which means, if I can figure out which page I actually want to be on, the guy who dies in the very first scene is Samuel Peters, number 60, the hammock that isn't there. Which also means that the guy who gets sent overboard in the Doom, the other Peter's brother, is Nathan Peters. And because I keep forgetting to do this, we know that he's the one who killed Lars Linda. Got to go back and fill that in. And there's one other piece of information that I can get out of this scene that I'm sure the game wants to make a lot simpler. So, hammock number 36. This is Omid Ghul, who is a Persian topman. And at this point... I can pretty easily narrow down the top men to just a couple of Chinese guys and the guy with the turban. I'm pretty sure the expectation is to say he's wearing a turban and he's not Chinese. He's the one guy from Persia. But he also has this sword hanging up next to his hammock. It's got a little bit of blood on the tip and a very distinctive shape. All the other swords that we've seen are... Straight swords. This one is a scimitar or other Middle Eastern curved blade. I think I probably just haven't played enough Dark Souls to really tell the difference. But if you watch what our turbaned friend is doing in Soldiers of the Sea, he goes running across the deck holding this sword. And in part eight, if you look up to the deck above, you can actually see him making to stab the creature with this very sword just after it dies. So I'm quite certain that number 36 is indeed Omid Ghul. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure the expectation is just straight up to see in like um, fucking Soldiers of the Sea 1 to just look up there and see like, oh, hey, look, there's a topman with a turban. He's Persian. Mm -hmm. yeah, the other information is... Um, is Persian. The other information is just there for extra bonus confirmation. Yep. But like I said, as much as it has steered me wrong every time, I don't like saying this person looks like they're this race or this nationality. All right, so that is, what, 51 fates complete and seven to go. Because third mate Martin Parrott and ship's, or Captain Steward Philip Dahl are not listed in the book, at least yet. I believe something must have happened to them that's chronicled in Chapter 8. But of the remaining seven, they can be pretty easily split into pairs and one guy who's by himself. So just like in Bitter Cold Part 1, 
it was interesting to compare the people that I see in this scene with the people who are listed as present. We pop up onto the deck. There is Omid Ghul looking out over the water. Possibly the lifeboat is still visible out there and just not within the scene that we see. Because we know it didn't get far enough to escape the beast. And then over here we've got fourth mate Davies and his steward finding the body of Lars Linda. I walked past all this stuff during the recording because I was already in finding the next body mode. But the five people sleeping in hammocks who appear in the sketch are number 56, that's Brennan. We've identified him. Number 52, the X hammock is Abraham Akbar. And 46, I believe, or 45, is uh, Leonid Volkov. He's sleeping in his hammock as well. And these two guys, torn in half guy with circles and last man standing. The hammocks whose occupants we haven't identified yet are 43, Maba from New Guinea, and 44, Lewis Walker from England. And again, the conclusion the game clearly wants me to draw is this is the guy with the tribal tattoos. He's the guy from the island of you know, multiple tribes who decorate their bodies in this way. But I don't like that. I didn't want to do that. So there's one more place where you can actually see hammocks hanging. And again, it's slightly out of my way to go back to it, so... I'm not going to bother, but, well, actually, I might as well. If the recording is going to be stable, let's do it, because it's right around the corner from where we were. We're on the same deck right here. This is the gun deck, and Hammock 44 is the only one that is still hanging. After everything that happened. Whoever this is set up their hammock again after the beast attack, after all the hammocks had been taken down so they could fire the guns. And of the two people that we have marked in the book, only one of them is still alive at the very end of it. This guy is Lewis Walker. Yep. And this guy is, as we suspected all along, Maba from New Guinea. And yeah, the game does want you to make like, or like at least expects you to make the call based on the tattoos, because as we noticed way back when, immediately when you have his death scene, he's already on board. Yep. And there have been a lot of cases where I actually did that while I was filling in the information, and then I realized I don't need to rely on that. I don't need to resort to it, so... I won't do it. Alright. So these two guys are a pair because they're both still alive after everything that's happened so far. So we can identify them as at least two of the people who have not yet perished. Now the one hammock that's hanging up here is 41. That is Wei Li. This guy... I have to assume is also got his hammock set up in the same area. He's not a topman. He's a seaman. And there was only one seaman in this area. That was George Shirley. I'm pretty sure that is this guy. And I will say, this one took me a lot longer to figure out in the first case. It was pretty much elimination at the end for him and a couple other people. Yeah. Apparently, like based on the information, what I found, you can apparently identify Shirley by his shoes. So you have another one where in the bitter cold one, you can see the feet hanging out. And then cross-reference that. See, I did that. I looked at the shoes, but 
they're not distinctive. They're the same shoes pretty much everybody else was wearing. In the meantime, watch that at some point. Hmm. And this guy is Wei Li. Which narrows things down a bit because we've only got one Chinese topman whom we haven't identified yet. One of the two people who have died up to this point. We've got him and Hamadou Diom. And Hamadou Diom is from Sierra Leone, not from China. This guy died in the first section of The Calling and is known to understand Chinese. The idea that a non-black person from Sierra Leone would speak Chinese in 1802 seems a little far-fetched to me. So I'm calling this guy Li Hong, the last surviving Chinese topman, or the last unidentified Chinese topman at this point. Mm -hmm. And I promise it is a coincidence that the two black guys are the last ones on my list. But Alexander Booth, number 49, his hammock is hanging up but empty. So he has not died, but he left the ship in the middle of the night along with Nathan Peters, whose hammock is hanging up next to his, and the purser who doesn't have a hammock because he's got an office. But that would be this guy. And so Hamadou Diom, the final guy, only one left to identify. And he is black, as I would have expected from someone from Sierra Leone in the early 19th century. And yeah, the only other information for Diom that I have is that you can notice in 7-2 that his hammock is gone. So he mm -hmm. must have died earlier, which can help in limiting the possible answers. But yeah, it's probably one of the ones that is better served to yep. done later. And now, it's back to the ship. Uh, back to the boat. Yep. Yeah, like I said, I did notice that uh, you know there were there were two people unidentified who didn't have hammocks there, and that was Whaley and Hamadou Diom. So they were the two that had died. There's one other thing that I thought was kind of interesting, though. I, mean, I poked around the ship a little bit more. I, I did look at the uh, uniform that I had been thinking of. It was the steward's room. So the steward's uniform is hanging on the wall, and I guess that's supposed to be how you can identify them. You can kind of look into the hole just a bit. You can see that door has been propped up. And also, there are spikes in the wall here. I'm pretty sure they were shot through from the other side. Largely because one of the two crab beasts never made it down here, and the other one was way over on the far side of the hold. I cannot imagine it managed to shoot through all these barrels to hit that wall. So, just something that I kind of wanted to observe while I know I've got the time to do it. Yeah, so if we... I might as well just say, like, mm -hmm. once we step onto the boat and leave, we're not coming back. Hmm. If you have anything left, get it out now. Yeah, nothing that I think I really need to show live. You know, again, I've, I've got some theories. I'll supplement them with overlaid footage from another recording if I need to. 
but at the very end you can still like rewind like after you finish the game you can rewind your save to this moment mm. as well in case you need it yeah i was kind of hoping that would be the case but let's go Is the watch doing something? No, you're supposed to look at him to confirm that you're leaving. Hmm. Or like basically look at him at a tot for a time until Ah, uh, okay. Finally. Sit down so you don't fall out. I don't have a sit down button. Hmm. All right, so we actually get to see what our insurance assessment adds up to. Okay, ship damaged in Squall, all cargo lost. Well, there's a lot of stuff still on the ship. Yeah, but if you'll see, it says ship sunk in storm Falmouth. So the storm we were rowing away from gave it the rest. Oh, okay. That that seems kind of contradictory or counterintuitive, or I'm, I'm not thinking of the word, but, like, we were the last people on the ship. Almost seems like the company would try to disclaim responsibility on that, but... Okay. Captain Witterell killed four crewmates. Is that right? Yeah, at the end. Oscott, Lewis, Walker, uh, Brennan, and... That's what I mean, is I'm, I'm not thinking of a fourth person. I'm not, I mean, they, they can't possibly mean himself. Um, yeah, it might be that it was something that happened in Chapter 8, but I can't imagine they'd base their... Uh, no, that's it. not it. All right. So, Hoskett and Nichols find for their crimes. Ooh, award to Martin Perrot. Okay, murder of one crewmate. Exceptional performance of duties by the bosun, of course. Now, now the the shooting of Zungi Sathi was not murder. Well, it gets counted as that. Yeah, see, this is what I was kind of wondering. You know, we were talking yesterday about the idea that, you know, there are many potential correct answers in a lot of cases. I wonder if, you know, or at least it would, it would be kind of neat if different answers that are still technically correct might affect the story in some way. You can almost well, it does affect it does affect this document, but. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really... There's not a lot going on afterwards, given that everybody's dead. Right. But yeah, so for instance, the guy, the midshipman that was on the beast that burned, mm -hmm. there was actually another midshipman stabbing his sword in the general direction. And I mm -hmm. believe you can actually like pin the death of the burning guy on the guy with the sword instead of burning. Oh... And so, like, I think, like, we should see that, um, what's his face? Um, what's his name again? Ab Abram Akbar should mm -hmm. be marked with murders. Oh. That could have been also just assigned to the beast.
Got it, yeah. Okay, no claim made for the passengers. Abandonment of crew and vessel? Yeah, apparently the passengers are also supposed to stick around. I guess, but did they read the rest of the report? And really, it seems like they owe Hoxing Lao's estate like tons. Yeah, evidently, we're not going to find out what that is. There you go. Extraordinary valor for bootment. That's well deserved, I think. Yeah, attempted mutiny, theft of cargo, kidnapping, kind of. Or no. Yeah. Yeah, he was the kidnapper. Mob is paid, donated to the pension fund. Yeah, I see. So here we have a state unknown. Mm hmm. Interestingly, Linda doesn't get marked for the abandonment of crew and vessel. Because yeah. he died before he got to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, there we go. Abram Akbar okay, yeah. got marked for murder of crewmate, too. Mm hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry, Abraham. I probably should have ruled differently on that. Alright, so I guess I just sign it. Well. Figure that's gonna be useful. Mm-hmm.